Welcome to Health Diary. My name is Winnie Lubembe and we're coming to you from Four Points by Sheraton right here in Harlingham. Now, hearing plays an important role in communication, speech and language development as well as learning. And so important is hearing that even a small amount of hearing loss can have profound negative effects on a person's general well-being. So today, we discuss noise-induced hearing loss and that discussion is coming up after this fact of the matter. Noise-induced hearing loss is permanent damage to the tiny hair cells in one's ears from loud sounds. According to Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, approximately 5.2 million children and adolescents aged 6 to 19 years and about 26 million adults aged 20 to 69 years have suffered permanent damage to their hearing from excessive exposure to noise. Noise-induced hearing loss, however, is the only type of hearing loss that is completely preventable if an individual practices good hearing health. All right, well, let's get to understand more about noise-induced hearing loss. And to help us with the discussion today is Dr. Uh, Lilian Werimu Moko, who is an ENT surgeon. Karibu sana. Thank you very much for making time for us. Thank and you. And also Dr. Sarah Ndegwa, who is a consultant audiologist. Thank you very much as well for coming by today. Can we just start with the basics, the ear? I think for most of us, we think, ah, it's common. So we know the ear is just outside and then that's it, right? But what really makes it up? The ear. Okay, so I'll start you off by explaining the ear. The ear is basically in three main parts. We have the outer ear, which acts as a filter. It collects sounds and directs them to the eardrum, which is this part here. And it marks now the beginning of our middle ear. This part mainly amplifies the sound. And so it acts as an amplifier that now transmits sound using three small bones into the inner part of the ear, which is a sensory organ of hearing that turns that sound into electrical signals mm -hmm. that are taken to the brain for the brain to be able to understand and interpret the, the sound that we're hearing so that we can respond appropriately. So then how do we measure sound? Like what's normal and what's not? Sound is measured in a unit known as decibels. What is a, it's a range of sound, so it can be from 20 decibels to all the way to 140 decibels. What is hazardous to hearing is any sound that is over 85 decibels. So when you have a conversational like now we are discussing here, the sound intensity is around 60 decibels. The whisper or you know like leaves outside in the environment, it's about uh, 40 decibels. And uh, when you have a lawn mower, for example, it's around 80 decibels to 90 decibels. And uh, so that's uh, basically what we have environmentally in terms of loudness, but of importance is the 85 decibels mark. Any sound that is over that potentially will damage hearing. Is it different in terms of kids or and, and adults or the measurement is the same? The measurement is, is the, the same, same. Okay. yes. All right. Now, how loud is too loud? Because, and how do I know? Because you see, you're talking about decibels and probably me and so many other people watching us thinking, I equally want decibels and all those things. So how do I know that this is too loud for me? Because people have different preferences. Usually when it is too loud, especially when you've had a lot of, you know, exposure to very loud sounds, after that you may hear a ringing sound in the ear. But we are lucky that we actually have a sound measurement apps that one can even download to tell you how loud is loud. When you're using your personal uh, devices, audio devices, usually you're, it's recommended that you do not put more than 60% volume up. That means when you begin to put in more than 70%, that is, that is already too loud. In factories, uh, usually they will have uh, areas designated that this area is too loud, so maybe you need to use personal uh, head de devices for ear protection. So that's one way you can know. Yo, you want to add and say? The most interesting thing about these uh, loud sounds is the fact that uh, whenever you go beyond the sound level, she has said, 80, 85 decibels, of importance is that for each 
increase in decibel range in terms of five decibels, mm -hmm. then the amount of time exposure also has to reduce. So we, it's not just about the loudness, it's also about the duration How of time, time yeah. that you're exposing yourself to such that the minute you go above 85 decibels, you have to keep taking breaks because um, for the allowed uh, hours for 85 decibels is like eight hours. Mm -hmm. So if you go to 90, then that goes down by half. So you're only allowed to use to listen for four hours. Four hours. When you go to 95, mm -hmm. it goes down to two, two hours. So the louder the sound, the less the time Exposure that you're supposed to be. expose yeah. yourself okay. to. Okay, all right. And it's important for us to understand about sound and how loud is too loud, because again, could be a factor as far as hearing loss is concerned. And today we're focusing on the noise-induced hearing loss. So then just <laughs> to define what exactly it is, and I'm pretty sure you've mentioned it, what would you say? So noise-induced hearing loss is basically a type of hearing loss that is permanent and it occurs due to prolonged exposure to loud sounds. And uh, this is something that uh, has been classified into three main types. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, sounds that you get from occupations. Those are people who work in factories. Mm -hmm. So they are at, they are, they are, those are people who are at risk of noise-induced hearing loss. And then we have the environmental noise. This is noise from traffic, our day-to-day -day activities, in cafes, in restaurants. That one is a, uh, is also a hazard. It's something that caused no causes noise-induced hearing loss. And then we have the the entertainment venues or what we call recreational noise. This is noise that we uh, are exposed to in our gyms, in our recreational activities, in nightclubs, and even when we use personal listening devices like earphones. Then how do I know that I am developing hearing loss? Is it gradual? Is it like drastic? Like you hear two loud music and then all of a sudden you develop hearing loss? Actually, the, that's the usual the issue because it comes in progressively. And so one doesn't always realize. There is the uh, one time exposure that you can have and you get what you call a temporary threshold shift. Uh, then it recovers. But if you continuously expose yourself to that, it becomes permanent like uh, Dr. Moko has said. If let's say, for example, it's 100 decibels, it's only recommended for 15 minutes. So, yeah. Mm. All right. Are there people who are more at risk as compared to the others as far as developing noise-induced hearing loss? Yes, those who are in occupational areas where they are just, by the nature of their work, it is very loud. But those ones, again, they are, it's recommended that they use earphones, uh, headphones, I beg your pardon, or earplugs that uh, reduce the amount of sound that is getting into the ear. Then there are those in uh, recreational activities, whether it's in the gym or in a concert. And uh, in fact, one of the important ones to remember is uh, firecrackers. Those ones, they generate a sound of almost 120 and above decibels. And that kind of a one-time exposure can cause a sudden hearing loss. The other types is gradual. So it comes in gradually. Uh, you, don't, you may not even realize it until much later when you begin to hear that in conversations you're not picking the words very well or you're having uh, some ringing sounds in the ears which we call tinnitus or for some people they are sensitive to regular sounds. We call that hyperacusis. So those are some of the telltale signs that you know you're beginning to have a hearing loss. What do you mean sensitive to regular sounds? It's a condition that comes in with uh, some element of hearing loss whereby you're just sensitive to even a sound that is ordinarily not uh, too loud, even a 70 decibel sound, it, you just kind of feel pain in the ear. So then what part of the ear exactly gets damaged? For instance, if one gets the noise-induced hearing loss. Mainly for, this is important for the people who use firearms, like the people in the military and the police. That uh, sudden loud sound usually can damage from the outer ear all the way to the inner ear. And that will give you sudden hearing loss. Now, the usual hearing loss where that happens gradually over time usually is due to a damage in the inner hair cells, that is in the inner part of the ear, where sound is transmitted into electrical signals. So there are two types of cells uh, that help in that regulation or amplification, kind of like a, a radio amplifier that helps you adjust the sounds. 
those are the outer hair cells and that is what gets damaged mm -hmm. so because when you expose yourself to excess noise they there's overuse mm -hmm. and there's mechanical damage to them so initially you find that uh, you will if you will only have a change or you will experience the symptoms the most common is a tinnitus mm -hmm. so the ringing will only be there for a short while and then it can come back within six to eight hours mm -hmm. so when you leave a club you go home your ears are ringing, you go to sleep, sometimes you wake up and it's still ringing. So you'll realize with time it becomes more and more because uh, as you expose yourself to more noise, that damage gets reversible. And so over time it becomes permanent and nothing, so far science has not found a way of regenerating or treating those cells. And aside from let's say environmental or maybe occupation, can we talk about children? Are they also at risk of developing hearing loss? Yes, and these are the, these children are actually one of the groups that are of concern, the children and the adolescents, because now with technology and with advance in the education systems, children are using more and more of the personal listening devices. We're also finding children walking around with phones, playing games and watching on the, on, on the devices. And what happens is that most of the children put those devices at very loud volumes, even when they are playing in the gaming areas. And so you find that they're actually more at risk because they, they, they are not aware that it is dangerous. So they keep adding the volume, they enjoy the volume. So the changes happen and over time, uh, it's, it's actually going to become a disaster. Currently, uh, the World Health Organization is estimating that out of two young people, one is exposed to dangerous noise levels. So one is at risk of developing a noise-induced hearing loss in, in the near future. I mean, that's very concerning when you say one in two. That's, that's very, very concerning, uh, right? Uh, yeah, that's something. Okay. And it's because of that that now the uh, World Health Organization has focused this year's World Hearing Day on just safe listening. So we are, in, we are planning to go to schools and give them health talks about health, safe listening to youth centers and, uh, you know, just the general public about the importance of safe listening because hearing loss is one of the commonest... Uh, you know, preventable cause of hearing. It's important for us to observe all the prevent, uh, preventive measures, really, so that we uh, help as many people out there. Okay, how about we take a break? But when we come back, we'd also need to understand, so far, because we talked about an aspect of it's permanent, right? Mm -hmm. So then what do we do in terms of management and just helping this person, you know, be able to at least not lose it completely, but just have some level of, you know, that they can hear. Are there devices for the same, or what are some of the interventions that um, are put in place to help this person who has a noise-induced hearing loss? So that part of the discussion is coming up after this break. Welcome back. This is Health Diary, and today our focus is on noise-induced hearing loss. And of course, to help us with the discussion is Dr. Wairi Momoko, who is an ENT surgeon, as well as Dr. Serendego, who is a consultant audiologist helping us understand more on why it is important to just make sure you observe how loud the noise that pro probably is around you is and what are some of the measures that we need to take to make sure that again we protect our ears as much as possible but right about now so how then do we diagnose um, hearing loss? For us mm -hmm. the, most of the patients are going to come to an ear doctor that is the ENT surgeon mm -hmm. and uh, usually we they have been experiencing symptoms. Usually by the time you're experiencing the symptoms, you've already had permanent damage that is reversible. That is something that is very important to note. Okay. So with those symptoms, we, and we, when we rule out other medical causes of uh, those symptoms, that's when we have to do tests, and that is where now the audiologist comes in. We send them to the audiologist. So Dr. Sarah, what are some of the tests that you do? Uh, the commonest one is called audiometry. The human ear hears a range of frequencies where you have the low pitch, the mid pitch, and the high pitch. The low pitch sounds are usually like vowels, and the high pitch are the consonants. So for the human ear, the range of hearing is between 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. But for the purposes of speech, the ones that we measure are between 250 hertz, which is a low pitch, and 8,000 hertz. So when we are testing for hearing, we test each and every of those frequencies. 
and we want to find out what is the quietest level at which one is able to hear. So the commonest test is uh, the audiometric test. There are other kind of tests that can be done for like younger babies where you don't necessarily require their cooperation. We just place some, you know, electrodes and uh, put some headphones on them and measure what we call objectively. From that, after we've gotten the quietest sound they're able to hear at each frequency, we plot uh, a diagram that we call the audiogram uh, that tells us the level of hearing of that person. Is it a normal hearing? Is it mild? Is it moderate loss, severe loss, or profound deafness? All right then, so how long normally do these tests take? Uh, it depends, but usually about uh, 15 to 20 minutes ah, per test. Right. Okay, it's not like go, come back, no, tomorrow, no, 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 no. Do yes, test. Yeah, yeah. Okay, 15 minutes and then that's it. So then once you establish, is, is this at this point where you pick which type of hearing loss? Yes. Okay, all right. So if we do find that the person has a hearing loss, then we proceed on to do a little bit more of the test we call diagnostics. So it helps us to identify where exactly is the problem. Is it in the uh, a conductive hearing loss, which is a problem in the outer or middle ear, or is it an inner ear problem? And if it is an inner ear problem, then we go on to do uh, the management, which is usually giving of hearing aids, because as we said earlier, that this is a permanent loss. So we try uh, to advocate for safe listening so that you don't get to having a permanent hearing, noise-induced hearing loss. So the management is really hearing aids, and uh, I have you a have few samples here, yes. here for you to see. Yes, I can see two of them, yeah. So maybe as she picks the samples, mm -hmm. I can add that also the, the pattern of the audiogram mm -hmm. is what tells us if it is noise-induced hearing loss, okay. if it is age-related ear hearing loss, or if it is a congenital or genetic type of hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So for noise-induced hearing loss, the type of curve is very important. Mm -hmm. And as we said, it affects the high frequencies. Mm -hmm. So you'll have normal that will now dip. And uh, so we also look at the, the pattern of the curve, and that helps us yeah. identify. All right, then. So some of the hearing aids that you have for us today. Yeah, the hearing aids come in uh, various kind of models, but the commonest are this one, which we call a RIC. Mm -hmm. This tiny. part, yes, it's <laughs> tiny. They're really uh, beautiful. Yeah. And so you put it behind the ear. The basics of a hearing aid, it has got uh, a microphone, mm -hmm. an amplifier, and a miniature loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. So this, is, uh, this portion here is inserted into the ear. For this one would be my left ear. Mm -hmm. You insert it right into the ear, and then you lift this and put it behind the, the ear. ear. Yes. yes. Okay. So this is one of the commonest models. It's easy and light on the ear. And even as uh, Dr. Moko described, when we look at the shape of your audiogram, the parts that have uh, gone through or have a hearing loss are those parts that will uh, um, be amplified because um, these are digital hearing aids. Mm -hmm. And that's what actually is in the market at the moment. We're just prescribing a digital hearing aid. So we amplify the part mm -hmm. that has got a hearing loss. Mm -hmm. And with noise-induced hearing loss, that usually happens in the high frequencies. Mm -hmm. We have another style, which we call uh, completely in the canal. So oh, we take so the shape of your ear and we model a shell such as this. Yes, you can hardly tell the one is wearing. Yes, right? you can hardly tell it's there. Yeah. So we have in this uh, uh, completely in the canal or even the invisible. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that we take the shape of your ear and build in this model. Mm -hmm. Within this hearing aid is now housed everything, that is mm -hmm. the microphone, the amplifier, and the loudspeaker. Okay. It runs, it's powered by a battery, but we also have for the other type of model where you can just put it on a charging dock mm -hmm. and a charge, we have rechargeable hearing aids as well. Mm -hmm. If, for example, you are in a blast and you completely lost your hearing, then the next level is what we call a cochlear implants, mm -hmm. which is a surgical procedure in which an electrode is placed into the ear surgically uh, to take over the role of those sensory hair cells that have been damaged. And then there's an external piece that is placed over there to pick up the sound and relate into the internal component. So is this an advanced form of the other one or? No, 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 no. Are, it's basically it's about preference. Yes. Although there are different technology levels, but uh, the style can be different. So. Different people, you know, prefer yeah. different uh, models. Yeah, yeah. So then, I'm, I'm trying to, to picture how it works. So you just put it in your ear and then that's it. 
That's it. Or is there like something that you need to do? Maybe like for instance, people who use on the phones maybe connect. I don't know. Really nowadays the technology has advanced. Mm -hmm. So we can pair it, Bluetooth pair it to your phone. You can receive uh, your phone calls through your hearing aid. Mm -hmm. uh, some are even more advanced that they can even be used uh, for health purposes that you can monitor uh, how many walks you make in a day, you know, how many mm -hmm. calories you've burned. So you can do a lot of things with uh, this okay. hearing aid technology. Of course, at night you have to remove it whenever you're taking a shower and so forth. Mm -hmm. Because it is an electronic uh, uh, piece device, mm -hmm. so you it cannot it's have water and so forth. So then once you have the hearing aids, you use it for life? Yes, right. because as we said, once you get damage to your to the inner hair cells of the ear, there's no going back. There's no going back, and the hearing loss is also progressive because mm -hmm. remember, as you age naturally, oh, yes. your hearing decreases. So, if you have a, a noise-induced hearing loss earlier in life, as you grow older, your hearing will go deteriorating. Mm -hmm. But when you start using hearing aids in good time, when the symptoms start occurring, mm -hmm. you can kind of stabilize the process mm -hmm. and uh, maybe you will have a longer time. Okay, so then for this one, in terms of like management of the same, taking care of it, just to make sure that you get the best service, do you have, for instance, for instance like you said, spectacles where you have to go, maybe change, you know, the lens, add, reduce, all those things. Is that the same for the, for the hearing aids? Uh, yes, what you can do, for example, as you go along, because they're digital instruments, you can reprogram them if the hearing loss is getting worse. So you can maybe add a little bit more power. Mm -hmm. And so you just connect this to the computer and just be able to do that. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's possible. That's possible, right? Okay, so are there challenges when it comes to, especially with the hearing aids, um, that maybe the person wearing them might face? The challenge is really based on the social stigma that there is that someone has a hearing aid, plus of course even the cost, the very cost of getting the hearing aid. But it is still very important that uh, if one has a hearing loss, that intervention must be done. And it must be done early in a timely manner. Because, for example, for children, if you can't hear very well, it affects speech and language development as well as now later on in school, uh, you know, later on opportunities for work. And as well as in school, they cannot quite hear the teachers, so their academic performance is, you know, much worse than it would be. In children, what I say is important that if you're amplifying, you must put hearing aids in both ears, not just one, yes. to allow them to hear sound in all totality, especially because they are learning speech and language and also because they're in school, uh, it's very important they get in both ears, mm -hmm. yeah. And then stigma. And it's just sad because we're like in this day and age, but people still get stigmatized. Yeah, there's a lot of stigma. Mm -hmm. Even the people who wear the hearing aids themselves, they feel stigmatized, especially the young people. Mm -hmm. But thank God for technology, we have different uh, designs of hearing aids, They're even those ones that are invisible. Mm -hmm. I also thank God for the AirPods and all those fancy things. Right now, having a gadget in your ear is not really a big deal. So I'm hoping with time we're going to accept this and, and live with this. Most people with a hearing loss, they tend to keep to themselves. Mm -hmm. They socialize less. Mm -hmm. So they are likely to develop uh, mental health issues like depression and such. Mm -hmm. We find that in the elderly, we've, there's a direct correlation between having hearing loss and developing early dementia or worsening or deteriorating fast in mm -hmm. case you get the dementia. Um, so then when it comes to costing, how much would, let's say, such interventions cost? So for one piece of hearing aid, depending on the technology level, it ranges to anything over 50,000 for one. Unfortunately, we, are not, we don't have insurances that most insurances don't cover for hearing services. That is for hearing aids or even the hearing test. So this is probably also something that we are trying to look into to encourage as many insurances to cover because it's a health priority. All right, and of course, very insightful discussion we had today as far as noise-induced hearing loss is concerned. And of course, a special thank you to Dr. Wairi Mumoko, who is an ENT surgeon, as well as Dr. Serandegua, consultant audiologist. Ladies, thank you very much. You've helped us learn a lot, really, as far as hearing loss is concerned, but more specifically on noise-induced hearing loss. And on that note, take a look at this health tip. 
you want to do some workouts for the body toning. Toning is uh, doing exercises that will make you have a lean body mass. We have the triceps. Triceps is this muscle here, the one at the back. This is what we call standing tricep extension with the bar. Hold it this way, bend your knees slightly, chest out, then you take it up, then back down. For 15 or 20 counts, there's some workouts for triceps with the dumbbells. You hold it this way, and then you bend. After you bend, bring your arms out, all right? Then you kick back. Also go for those many repetitions. You'll see how the my triceps are moving, meaning it's going there direct. All right, that is what we call triceps kickback. Well, just recently, the world celebrated World Hearing Day with the theme to hear for life, listen with care. And takeaway message is make sure that you observe all the preventive measures as far as hearing is concerned. So my name is Winnie Lubembe. A special thanks to Four Points by Sheraton for hosting us. But until next time, adios.